Good day, everyone. I'm Nigel Fields, Superintendent of Virgin Islands National Park and Virgin Islands Coral Reef National Monument. This recording features a presentation on the Keneal Bay Area Redevelopment and Management Plan. This presentation corresponds with the public comment period that closes on February 17, 2022. I'll mention more about this public comment period towards the end of the presentation. Next slide. Thank you. During this session, we'll review a short background on Keneal Bay. I'll explain the purpose and need of the National Park Service to outline a future for the, for the Keneal Bay area. I'll share four preliminary alternatives for future activities and use of the site. The key environmental issues that may differentially affect outcomes across the four alternatives will be mentioned. And importantly, I'll explain how you can provide the critical public comment that we're seeking. From what we understand, there have been transitional and permanent settlements on St. John for over 2,000 years. Piano artifacts found on St. John and within the area of Camille Bay reveal thriving, stable, sophisticated cultures. The colonial period introduced permanent settlements of Africans and Europeans across the Caribbean, and Camille Bay contains historic structures and archaeological features which speak to this tumultuous period. Camille Bay is a key site in the 1733 slave revolt which sparked a series of subsequent protests against slavery in the New World. Lifeways on St. John continued to evolve during this post-colonial period, which introduced additional cultures, leading to the American transfer in 1917. A focus on tourism eventually led to the idea of establishing a national park, and Lawrence Rockefeller's interest in establishing a new model of ecotourism led him to purchase an existing modest resort in the 1950s. He envisioned a version of Camille Bay that would focus on the natural and cultural features of the landscape. Next slide, please. In 1983, Camille Bay Resort was donated to the National Park Service. It was done so, though, under a retained use of state. It's a unique feature. Uh, the, the RUE, as we called it, allowed the resort to continue operating independently for 40 years until September 30th. 2023. This upcoming transition in 2023 was anticipated over a decade ago, and a public law allowed the National Park Service to determine if a non-competitive long-term lease was the best option for seamless operations of resource protection, of operating the resort, and also of continuous economic benefit. At the time, the National Park Service began negotiating with the holder of the RUE RUE to begin evaluating the site. This included nominating historic structures as contributing features of the Camille Bay Historic District. This period also included some site assessments to identify any environmental concerns. In 2013, an unfinished report recommended the transition of the RUE into a lease. However, more environmental investigation was needed. So between 2014 and 2016, environmental sampling on the site revealed contaminants of concern as they were described in the 2017 report. But in 2017, we had the hurricanes, Hurricanes Irma and Maria, which caused extensive damage across the Virgin Islands and also closing Camille Bay Resort. Overnight accommodations have not resumed yet on, uh, at Camille Bay. This event changed the equation of the goals that we had. Not only is there a need to establish a potential commercial agreement for Camille Bay Resort. There's also the need to rebuild the resort. So being mindful of this and being mindful of this shared history between St. John, the National Park Service, and Camille Bay, we went to the public to ask about the future. We asked the public back in April and May of 2021, what connections do you have to Camille Bay? We wanted to hear what thoughts people in the public had about preserving the history and the culture of Camille Bay and of St. John. What have been some of the greatest challenges of the resort in the past? And how can we make sure that the National Park Service can improve operations at Camille Bay as we move into the 21st century? We heard tremendous feedback. We were so pleased to hear from hundreds of people across the country. Uh, and a number of people uh, spoke and shared their voices from the Virgin Islands and from St. John. Uh, there was a significant focus on the cultural significance of the, of the area, looking at the uh, colonial features, the post-colonial features uh, that are represented 
minute there, um, the importance of access to residents and visitors. Um, so that Camille Bay is not something that's separate from them, but something they can engage in. The deep affection that uh, both employees and long-term visitors have had with one another and to the site. We also heard about the importance of Camille Bay to the local economy and the vision for there being continued community stewardship through making sure there's living wages and that there's a focus on hiring locals at St. John to represent a community-focused approach to managing the resort. We also heard about rebuilding in sustainable and resilient ways and making sure we could protect the natural and the cultural resources that make Camille Bay so special. Here you see a map of the area of our study. So on the left, uh, you can see the uh, general outline of St. John and the area of particular interest in the box in red. You also see in the box down below the existing maintenance facility area, which is right downtown Cruise Bay. This is where the Park Service has its current maintenance facility, and that's going to be relevant to a couple of our alternatives. And then to the right, you see uh, the map of the, in, in broader scale, the map of the Camille Bay Resort there. The purpose of this redevelopment plan is to identify a sustainable and resilient redevelopment strategy for Camille Bay area that preserves and protects its significant cultural and natural resources while providing a range of visitor experiences, including overnight and day use opportunities and promotes economic activities that integrate the values and history of the community of St. John. There's a lot of words there, but if we look a little bit closer, Let's pull out a few of these. When it comes to sustainability and resilience, we want to make sure we're ensuring a good investment in the public's trust. We have learned so much since the Rockefeller era about how to be light on the land, how to design safe water and energy systems to minimize adverse impacts, construction materials and practices that can withstand the environment. We also know it's the National Park Service's mission to protect the natural and cultural resources that are within our care. And it's, in part, it's an important part of our purpose to engage visitors in meaningful experiences, rich experiences that help them learn about these resources and hopefully to learn to love them and to help us care for them. We also recognize that there's an opportunity for economic activity here, uh, and that can be done equitably and it can be done in a way that balances environmental protection. And no matter what happens with the alternatives, we want to make sure that the values and the specificity of St. John really shine through. Uh, there are many Caribbean experiences, but there's really only one Camille Bay, only one St. John, and Camille's future must reflect the history, the people, and the values of St. John. So we have a need to address the ongoing cultural natural resource impacts that are associated with the hurricanes. We also have a need to make sure that Camille Bay is integrated with the overall management approach of the Virgin Islands National Park and to ensure that there's accessibility and a welcoming presence for local community members, for our guests, for visitors that are coming to St. John once the RU expires September 2023. So our objectives answer our needs. We want to establish that National Park Service experience on the landscape of Camille Bay. We want to provide for those economic opportunities that are in balance with the natural and cultural resources, protect those natural and cultural resources and the marine resources in a way that's really light on the landscape as envisioned by Lawrence Rockefeller, and once again to integrate that overall RU footprint into the entire footprint of the park. So we'll discuss these four alternatives. There's a no-action alternative, which is essentially a non-commercial opportunity. So we'll discuss that, uh, what it is for us to have Camille Bay with no economic or no commercial activity. And then we'll also discuss the three different alternatives where there could be commercial activity. So let's focus on that first one, the no action alternative. Again, the no action alternative is the National Park Service not issuing a lease or a concession. So we're not looking at developing uh, any commercial activity and the overnight activity. Here, we would make sure we're minimally restoring the area, making sure that the beaches have access, that the roads and trails are safely opened. Uh, we would come up with a management approach to look at what uh, structures are stable enough to remain, what others may need to be modified or stabilized. And we would 
come up with management approaches for monitoring the natural and cultural. Also, we're upholding the law while making sure there's safe access. So that's what would happen if we have no commercial activity, but the area turns into a similar and is managed similarly to other areas of the North Shore, uh, North Shore area of the park. Moving to commercial opportunities, we mentioned there are three of them, uh, and we'll go through them, but I want to first mention that with all three, we're looking at greater public access. With all three, we're looking at make, making sure there's a protection of the cultural and natural resources, that we're being sensitive um, to the landscape, no matter what development happens, we make sure it's light on the land. And regardless of those, uh, which three is chosen, the experience of the guests would be commensurate with the rich history of the site. So going to alternative A, this um, is our preliminary proposed action. Uh, there are a number of things that you see um, in the map to the right. You see these color schemes. So we're going to talk about each of these colored areas one by one. So the first tier is the resort designated zone. In this example, in this alternative, uh, the resort area is largely maintained um, in the, with the key features that uh, were a part of the resort previously. So Keneal Beach, Scott Beach, Paradise Beach, Turtle Point are all still a part of that landscape. Uh, and these responsibilities would most likely be turned over to a developer or an operator under a lease. There are some things we'd have to consider with this uh, leased approach to this area. Scott's Beach uh, seems to be in a, in a floodplain, so there may be a redesign or there could be a movement of those cottages to a different location. The existing pier will remain and it could be used by both the Park Service as well as uh, as the resort. Uh, but this is um, stating that the entire 150 acres is not necessary for running the full resort, but most of the main features and the amenities of the resort would be maintained in this area that you see outlined in purple. The blue zone here uh, offers additional opportunity for public access and also commercial opportunities. So the area around Hawks Nest Beach and Honeymoon Beach will be pulled out of the existing footprint of the RUE and allowed to be separate commercial activities for day use and potentially for overnight use as well. So let's talk about Honeymoon Beach. At Honeymoon Beach, there's the opportunity for there to be day use activities there that would include some uh, necessary and appropriate activities, perhaps like having food and beverage service and water sports activity. You would still be able to walk from uh, the downtown area through the Lynn Point Trail to reach Honeymoon Beach, as people can do today, with a potential commercial concessions opportunity there that would provide visitors with uh, important services. That stretch going from Honeymoon Beach going to the beginning of the resort as it meets the area around the, the purple there would all be open to the public. So that would help connect the trail system from them point to um, to the Tamarind Trail to Keneal Trail. So that offers an extra opportunity for the trail system and walking through the area to be pretty contiguous. Going over to Hawks Nest Beach, you see the area around Hawks Nest Bay. We're talking about the part of Hawks Nest that is connected to the original Keneal Resort. Uh, so not the public day use area that most people are familiar with today that people make use of, but this is the Hawks Nest Beach that's uh, to the west of that area uh, and is within the footprint of the uh, Camille's RUE. There are cottages there and there's an opportunity for there to be mid-priced overnight accommodations as well as some day use activity there as well. So this alternative allows us to explore those possibilities of public access in these areas where there could be day use at Honeymoon and Hawks Nest and potentially overnight at Hawks Nest. The green areas are currently undeveloped and under this uh, scenario, they will remain undeveloped. Uh, there are trails in some of these areas. We want to make sure those trails continue to be open or accessible, uh, but we're not looking at any development in the areas that are currently developed. There's also um, a special opportunity for us to have a operations and maintenance zone where there's a shared campus for the National Park Service as well as for the uh, developer or operator of the resort. By coincidence, the National Park Service has been looking at uh, updating and rebuilding its maintenance facility 
And the timing is aligning to where these activities of the Canil Bay Resort redevelopment and our maintenance facility redevelopment is happening around the same time. So there could be an opportunity here, instead of having two different facilities within two miles of each other, we could have a campus where we could have our facilities and those of Canil's in the same vicinity, in the same area there. It could allow for some efficiencies, um, and it could also allow for us to make good use of the existing maintenance facility, which is right downtown Cruz Bay. We could repurpose this area for a transportation hub, which would allow for significant amounts of parking, so we don't have to build a lot of parking areas in the Canil Bay area. Most of that parking can happen downtown. We could have a transportation um, plan where the taxis and other uh, rental cars, what have you, could be based at this location to get people to and from the other North Shore beaches. Electrification of vehicles, all can be happening in this centralized location. So this transportation hub making use of the current maintenance facility offers us a way to solve some additional problems that we've been facing with downtown parking. Uh, so there's an opportunity here for us to combine our facilities there for maintenance and then open up the transportation hub downtown to help solve some of those problems. The last element here would be the interpretive and engagement zone. Uh, this is a really special opportunity here. So this area that's in that kind of brighter orange uh, that begins down by the entrance where the star is on the map going down the, um, uh, down the driveway to that integration of where the resort and the day use area is. That's where many of the historic features in Canil Bay remain. There's some uh, real key archaeological sites there as well. This would be an opportunity for the National Park Service to have a presence on the resort to help interpret the history and the, the facilities there in a way that engage people in this rich history. It also allows for the Park Service to partner with another organization to design, fund, construct, and maintain a community space uh, such as an amphitheater, a museum, or a cultural center. So this alternative aid, as I mentioned, has many different features. So it takes the entire landscape and makes it to where there's accessibility for more of the resort, uh, still maintaining the opportunity for some of the key features of the resort uh, to be maintained, looks for operational efficiencies with a shared maintenance facility, and also brings in a National Park Service presence and an opportunity for a partnership with an outside organization to run a community space. Alternative B is Similar in some ways. The main difference here is that Hawks Nest Beach remains a part of the original resort footprint. So we're no longer looking at there being a separate um, commercial opportunity there. The commercial opportunity at Hawks Nest is just a part of the main lease as a whole. But the uh, opportunity for uh, special commercial activity down by Honeymoon remains. And that public access uh, going from downtown through the resort also remains. Uh, we still have in this scenario the shared maintenance facility and the potential transportation hub downtown. We also have in this uh, in this scenario the opportunity for a shared community space or a community space, pardon me, uh, with uh, an outside partner uh, to build, fund, and maintain this community space, be it an amphitheater or a museum. Uh, but we lose some of the National Park Service presence here. We would turn those responsibilities of interpreting and maintaining uh, those historic features to the developer and to the resort. Alternative C keeps the landscape and the overall features of the original resort fairly intact. Um, and so it would all um, go under one commercial entity in this case. So instead of having multiple commercial opportunities, we would just have the one. Uh, so there are some efficiencies with that approach. Uh, and it would also um, uh, not allow us to have the shared uh, maintenance facility. Uh, there's not in this scenario the opportunity for the uh, community space. Uh, but it does allow us to have a fairly seamless uh, similar transition to uh, a leased opportunity for the resort uh, in a way that's quite similar to what we have now. Uh, in this scenario, though, we would work with the developer and with the operator of the hotel to make sure there still is public access. So regardless of the scenarios, uh, we would find ways to make sure that public access to the beaches and some of the amenities is a part of the, um, the agreement that we would have with the uh, commercial operator. Environmental issues that 
will be different across these alternatives are key things that we want to evaluate. And so the information and data that we can gather on these environmental concerns are going to be key. Uh, some of the ones that are really important to us now that we know there's going to be distinctions between these alternatives include visitor use and the visitor experience. Clearly across these three, there's different types of engagement that a visitor can have. We would like to evaluate that. Um, the amount of development that happens uh, on the resort will impact the cultural resources and give us different ways of protecting the archaeology. So we want to make sure that there's thorough analysis of each of those in a ways that protects those cultural resources and the archaeological riches that are there on the site. We have historic buildings. Uh, we have to understand the integrity of the buildings, those materials, and find ways if we can to maintain that those uh, the integrity of those buildings. And there's different options there between those three uh, scenarios of development and non-development. And of course, if there's um, no commercial activity at all. We have to evaluate that as well. So that's going to be key as well. So any data that we have and that we'll collect uh, on historic structures will allow us to better understand the impacts um, and how they vary across those four alternatives. Development is going to have an impact upon the coastal resources, but we know they can be mitigated and there's ways to do development safely. So looking at the shoreline, looking at ways to make sure the coral and the marine uh, environment is protected is going to be key across all four of those alternatives. And things like the floodplain, where we want to make sure we're being smart about development, uh, is going to be a key part of our analysis as well. Right now, we're looking at the alternatives, how we're going to look at the landscape and what type of development is appropriate, where, uh, to what degree we need commercial activity or not. Uh, our goal is to continue this conversation with the public uh, to wrap up this analysis and get to a decision by the end of this year. And that decision is going to help us, the decision we focused on whether or not there'll be commercial activity or no commercial activity, whether there's the action or the no action. Uh, and so, uh, once we have decided whether or not there's commercial activity or not, it lets us now figure out the next set of steps. In the event that it's decided that commercial activity uh, is appropriate and we're going to go with commercial activity on the site, that leads us to, in the process of having the request for proposals or prospectus for concessions uh, in um, the end of 2022 going into the beginning of 2023. Uh, that gets us ready uh, to have a decision or selection from uh, those commercial opportunities toward the middle of the year 2023 so that we can move forward with designing and um, um, mapping out what those options could look like on the landscape with the developers being able to design what the visitor services would be uh, into the, um, to the, to the middle of 2024. After that point, we'd expect construction um, to begin uh, and then phasing in the uh, opening of the facilities uh, between 2025 and 2026. So our most immediate next steps are making sure we're getting good public feedback uh, now between now and February 17th. I really want to hear from you. So just a reminder that public comment period closes February 17th, 2022. In the meantime, we're continuing the environmental investigation that we launched uh, last year. Uh, our goal is to wrap up uh, our analysis of the most recent collection of environmental samples, have that information available to the public in the spring of this year, to finalize the document by the summer in July, and then to have our action plan for cleanup by September 2022. Uh, we also, around this time in the fall, expect to get back to you what we've heard from you uh, during this redevelopment public comment period uh, with our overall environmental assessment document that will contain our preferred alternative, the analysis, and any significant public feedback that we would receive that we would analyze and share back with you. And our goal is to get, as I mentioned, to a decision by the end of this calendar year, whether we're going to have action or no action. The best way you can help us is to Give us any feedback that you have on the clarity of our purpose, need, and objectives as I mapped them out earlier in the presentation. Do they make sense? Do they resonate? Is it clear? Does it contain, does it reflect uh, the things that are most important to the future of, of Camille Bay? We like your feedback on these conceptual alternatives. There's a range that I presented here, and we'd love to hear from you. 
on them. And also, if there are specific activities, services, or important data that you feel that you have to offer, that would also be very welcome during this public comment period. You can provide your comments by going to parkplanning.nps.gov slash Camille Bay Redevelopment, or you can mail or hand deliver your comments to the park headquarters. Uh, you can do that by mailing them or hand delivering to us at uh, Camille Bay Redevelopment slash Management Plan. Uh, make it attention to the superintendent, 1300 Cruise Bay Creek, St. John, USVI, area code 00830. We must receive your public comments by February 17th, 2022. When you go to the website, the park planning website, uh, you'll notice uh, when it pops up on the left, there's step one where you can click on uh, open for comment. That takes you to um, the document page where you can click on the newsletter. You'll also, once you do that, you'll see to the left, uh, the comment now. Once you click on the comment now, the screen pops up where you can enter your name, your address, and also um, uh, your comments. So it's just a few steps to get there, but it's fairly straightforward. So um, we want it to be as simple as possible. So please uh, make use of this tool. It's a very effective and helpful tool to provide your comment uh, so that we can document and be able to uh, re be as responsive as possible to, to all the comments that we're receiving. So this is a really unusual opportunity um, for us to uh, take this moment to look at the future of such a special place. Uh, we approach this opportunity with humility, with thoughtfulness and excitement. So we thank you for your participation and we look forward to hearing from you.